manage their banks. Later this month, in closing, I will say we will hear from regulators about what they can do to strengthen their oversight and supervision and how we can make the banks and our financial system more resilient. And then we'll hear directly from the failed bank executives who must answer for their bank's downfalls. But today our focus is on how to improve the tools we have to hold them accountable and prevent those failures from happening in the first place. Ultimately, bank executives are responsible for the success or failure of their institution. They're responsible for keeping depositors' money safe. They know when they sign up for a job that banking is built on trust. They're responsible for holding up their end of the deal. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we're supposed to be talking about holding executives accountable after recent bank failures. But from where I sit, all I see is finger pointing. I don't see anyone from the bank executives to the regulators to the Biden administration taking meaningful accountability for their actions that played a role in the recent bank failures. We should 100 percent discuss certain authorities regulators have to claw back executives' compensation if that individual acted in malpractice. And we should discuss the lack of accountability at the executive and board of director level as well. But we should not forget that the regulators should also be held accountable. So like I've said from the beginning, this was a failure in three parts. And we must discuss accountability across the board for bank executives, bank regulators, and this administration's inflationary spending policies. And I look forward to addressing these issues later in hearings this month. As for the bank executives, these were not your average banks. They were like the Las Vegas betting tables of banks that rolled the dice on falling interest rates when everything pointed in exactly the opposite direction. And if that didn't have the red alert sirens going, we now know that they suffered rampant mismanagement and these very same risks that brought the banks down were in plain sight to the supervisors flashing red lights without a question. What a blatant disregard for economic conditions, a disregard for supervisory warnings, and a disregard for basic corporate governance and risk controls. To start, SVB operated without a chief risk officer for eight months following the resignation of the previous officer in April of 2022. A very fast-growing bank, unprecedented growth, without a risk officer for eight consecutive months. But even more concerning is when Silicon Valley Bank failed, it had 31 open supervisory findings, and that level of findings is about three times the number of other peer banks. As a Charlestonian, I'm going to put it a different way. We are known for amazing restaurants, and fantastic food. If one of our restaurants had 31 safety or health violations, they would be shut down in a heartbeat. We wouldn't get to 31. But what's more, if an inspector failed to take note of those 31 safety or health issues in the first place, they would lose all credibility and their jobs. Regulators must also be held accountable for their supervisory failures to the same extent that the failed bank execs and the directors should be. Otherwise, there is no incentive for anyone at fault to change. Just last week, we received the Federal Reserve and FDIC's report on the failures of SVB and Signature Bank. The Federal Reserve report acknowledged the supervisors did not fully appreciate the extent of the vulnerabilities at SVB as it grew in size and complexity. But rather than focusing on these failures and providing mechanisms to ensure sufficient steps are taken in the future, the Federal Reserve used the report as a scapegoat to push its progressive regulatory agenda. Where is the accountability for the inaction on the Federal Reserve? I think we should all keep in mind that the last time Michael Barr testified before the committee, he would not commit to firing any of the employees who failed to do their jobs. 
The FDIC's report also found supervisory failures as well as failures in bank management. Additionally, after the failure of a second California bank, First Republic, with over $200 billion in assets over the past weekend, it is clear that the practices and the standards of the California state supervisors also merit congressional scrutiny. Turning back to the bank executives, we must find a path forward to holding bad actors accountable. We all know that market behavior is a driving force and perhaps we should look to strengthening corporate responsibility through good governance mechanisms. For example, it has been reported that SVB's bonuses came with so-called clawback provisions that would allow the lender to recoup, recoup the pay if there was wrongdoing. However, th there was no provision allowing the bank to claw back the money if excessive risk taking led to the losses. I certainly think this is something we can and should discuss. At the same time, if good governance reforms are not appropriately targeted and calibrated, an overly prescriptive approach has the, po has the potential to further siphon and divert talent away from the banking sector to non-bank sectors of the financial services industry. As we have seen here, good management is absolutely essential. Recruiting talented uh, folks at financial institutions is of the utmost importance in making sure that these institutions run smoothly and soundly. It is questionable whether we should be encouraging supervisors to dedicate more time, attention, and manpower to evaluating the risk, riskiness of compensation practices when they have failed to resolve bread and butter banking practices at these failed banks. The FDIC, the SEC, and the DOJ have authorities to hold management at these failed banks accountable for any misconduct. At the end of the day, the United States banking system is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world. What is the point of having law after regulation, after rule, after guidance? If the regulators aren't using the tools they already have at their disposal. It doesn't matter what we do in Congress if the regulators don't implement and enforce the laws we create as intended. With that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and on accountability across the board with existing authorities and any potential suggestions you may have. Uh, thank you, Senator Scott. Um, I just, before introducing the, the witnesses, I just came from a meeting with the CEO of, of, East, of, of Norfolk Southern. Uh, and I think most of you know the, the terrible train tragedy, the derailing in, in East Palestine. And uh, I, one of the comments I've made about this is we know that uh, when that happened, when Silicon Valley Bank happened, the first thing I thought of was East Palestine because of the, in the history of our country, the last hundred years, the most powerful two interest groups in this country are the banks and the railroads. And I know we often hear about all these rules and all these regulations on banks, but we also know this town swarms with bank lobbyists so often getting their way and weakening those rules and intimidating regulators, and we know all that. So um, I'll introduce the witnesses. Da Lin is an assistant professor of law at the University of Richmond. Her scholarship focuses on financial regulation, securities regulation, and corporate governance. Ms. Lin, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Thomas Quadman is executive vice president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Center for Capital Markets Competitiveness, Chamber Technology Engagement Center, and the Global Innovation Policy Center. Mr. Quadman, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, Ms. Heidi Schooner is a professor of law at the Columbus School of Law, the Catholic University of America. Her scholarship focuses on the regulation of the financial services industry. Welcome back to the committee. Nice to see you again. Um, Ms. Professor Lynn, you start, please. Thank you, Senator. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you. My name is Da Lynn. I am an associate professor of law at the University of Richmond School of Law, where I study and teach corporate governance, financial regulation, and securities regulation. I would also like to thank my supporters' family, who are here with me today, my husband Parth, and our ever-curious toddler, Oliver. Federal banking regulators have broad authority to remove bankers from office for engaging in deceptive, 
unsafe or unsound practices, and even to permanently prohibit them from working in the banking industry. Unfortunately, this authority has rarely been used against bank directors and senior executives, even when their mismanagement results in bank failure. I will briefly explain the current statutory landscape and then discuss potential reforms to strengthen bank oversight and governance. Under current law, federal banking regulators may permanently bar any employee of a bank from working in the banking industry under the following circumstances. If an individual, one, participated in misconduct, including violations of law, breaches of fiduciary duties, and unsafe or unsound practices. Two, the misconduct harmed the bank or benefited the wrongdoer. And three, the misconduct involved personal dishonesty or demonstrated willful or continuing disregard for the safety or soundness of the institution. Over the past 20 years, America's largest banks have settled hundreds of major lawsuits and paid over $195 billion in fines and penalties. They have admitted to pervasive fraud, bribery, money laundering, price fixing, illegal kickbacks, discriminatory lending, and a host of other consumer protection violations. Yet, Federal banking regulators have barred senior management of only one major U.S. bank from the industry. Instead, regulators have primarily excluded rank-and-file workers for low-level misconduct, such as embezzlement, that has little impact on bank safety or administration. In my study of enforcement actions issued by the Federal Reserve between 2015 and 2019, I found that 72% of individuals prohibited from banking were low-level employees who had already been terminated from their jobs. And after the 2008 financial crisis, banking regulators barred 21 rank-and-file workers but did not impose a sanction on a single senior executive. This disparity exists because the current law is not well designed to be applied to senior bank leadership, particularly at larger banks. There are two main obstacles. First, the culpability requirement for removal and prohibition is overly demanding, requiring, as I have mentioned, personal dishonesty or a willful or continuing disregard for the safety or soundness of the institution. Yet, failed management is seldom a deliberate act and it is even less likely to be provable as one. Directors and senior executives are typically shielded from knowledge of operational details by the diffuse decision-making processes that characterize most large and mid-sized banks. Second, as banks have consolidated and grown over the past 30 years, the role of senior bank leadership has transformed. Their responsibilities consist increasingly of institutional oversight, rather than participation in operational details. Today, when senior bankers fail to adequately perform their jobs, it is nearly always because they either neglected known issues or they were uninformed because they did not establish systems, structures, and internal controls designed to effectively detect operational risk. However, the statute underlying the prohibition authority has not been substantively updated since 1989. While the responsibilities of bank leadership are increasingly systemic in character, the requirements that regulators must satisfy to prohibit an individual from the industry remain focused on discrete activities. Congress should recognize mismanagement and institutional oversight failure as a distinct basis for removal and prohibition. I would like to close by observing that the authority to remove individuals from office and prohibit them from working in the banking industry is one of several tools available to federal regulators to hold bankers accountable for unsafe or unsound practices. And I applaud the committee for also considering proposals to broaden this toolkit. I want to emphasize, however, that those other mechanisms cannot replicate or replace a potent removal and prohibition authority in strengthening bank governance. The same bank directors and executives whose mismanagement caused a bank to fail should not be permitted to run your bank. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lynn. Mr. Quadman, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Brown and uh, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee, for holding this hearing. From the information that is available, it appears that the recent banking turmoil is a result of a failure of supervision, management, and governance. The subject of this hearing today covers three banks out of 4,500 in the United States. It's also important to remember that those three banks had very unique business models. 
Silicon Valley Bank concentrated on capital intensive uh, tech startups as well as biomedical startups. First Republic Bank concentrated on wealth management, whereas Signature Bank uh, had a large exposure to digital assets. Those business models are much different than the traditional regional banks uh, that provide financial resources for Main Street businesses. Turning to executive compensation, we have to remember that there is a global marketplace for CEO and executive talent. Compensation is key for acquiring and retaining the talent needed for the long-term success of a business. The Chamber has been on record since 2005, where we've been critical of behavior that drives short-termism, specifically the use of earn quarterly earnings guidance. Furthermore, if policies do not align with market demands, businesses will suffer. There are multiple checks on compensation, specifically in governance in general. We have investor and board oversight, which comes with it for publicly traded companies, SEC clawback authorities, as well as SAM pay votes. We have the Federal Deposit Insurance Act, which allows for the, for the recoupment of compensation, of which over $4 billion has been recovered. There's a 2010 Joint Bank Regulating Regulator Guidance on Sound Incentive Compensation Policies, which, in our view, fulfills the, uh, the requirements of Section 956 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Additionally, we have the Orderly Liquidation Authority, Clawback Authority as well. This failure of supervision is quite startling. We have MRAs that went back as far as, to, as 2020. There's in the, FD, in the Federal Reserve report from last Friday, we have seen how there was a lack of communication between management and the board on key issues. Those are red flags that should have been brought to the immediate attention of the regulators and action should have been taken. Furthermore, while the regulators were not taking action, JP Morgan Chase issued an investor note in November on the interest rate risk with Silicon Valley Bank. More so, we have to be very careful about how new policies are going to be developed uh, in this area. We sent a letter to the banking regulators, both in terms of, the, of this banking crisis as well as a holistic review on capital requirements, that the Federal Reserve and other banking regulators be transparent with the data, share that with stakeholders, in order to fulfill the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act as well as the Regal Act. Furthermore, we have to look at some of the legislation that's before the committee today. The Warren Hawley bill would allow for a five-year clawback of salary and compensation. Who would want to go work for any business that has a five-year clawback of salary? Furthermore, that clawback authority also, go, also extends to professionals such as lawyers and accountants. Which professional firm is going to want to engage in that kind of contract and that is going to deprive those businesses of the talent they need to govern themselves. Furthermore, there's a Reed Grassley bill, which we are sympathetic with. However, A, there needs to be more information on it, but let's also not forget that insider trading is already illegal. Heaping more authorities is not necessarily going to mean anything if the cop on the beat isn't doing anything. And finally, let me just close with Credit Suisse, which is a cautionary tale. In 2013, the Swiss uh, passed new uh, compensation policies, which prohibited bonuses, restricted salary, and had a binding say and pay vote. Credit Suisse's uh, stock took a hit once that passed, and it never recovered. Furthermore, from 2013 moving forward, Credit Suisse has cited those compensation pol policies as an obstacle to their being able to retain and attract talent, and actually flagging that as a risk to the long-term health of the bank. We need to keep that in mind because we also know how that ended. Mr. Chairman, thank you and happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Quadman. Uh, Professor Schooner, welcome. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing on the accountability of bank executives. In my testimony, I offer two central observations. First, bank executives play a critical role in maintaining the strength of our financial system, and that role requires a diligence and care that sets them apart from managers of non-bank firms. Second, Congress has recognized the importance of bank executives' responsibilities by authorizing federal bank regulators to hold executives accountable for management failures. Existing law, however, could be reformed to provide stronger accountability for bank executives who act negligently or for the board members who fail in their oversight responsibilities. As the committee well knows, banks are special in the services that they provide, and they are also inherently fragile. 
subject to the kinds of runs that we've seen all too recently. Such characteristics justify extensive regulation of banks' operations, but the responsibility for safety and soundness of the institution ultimately rests with bank management. While managers owe fiduciary duties to their institutions, just like officers and directors of any corporation, their critical responsibilities do not end there. Bank executives are responsible for managing inherently risky institutions that are critical to sustaining the health of the economy and thus the well-being of all citizens. We're res they are responsible for institutions that rely on taxpayer uh, backing in the form of deposit insurance and uh, emergency liquidity. Recent events amply illustrate the extent of this dependence. Bank management is a heavy responsibility indeed. In the United States and around the world, the importance of management to bank safety and soundness is recognized from cradle to grave. Law and regulation expressly demand competent management from the institution's initial chartering to the supervision of the bank's ongoing operations and through to the resolution of the failed institution. Federal law also imposes liability on bank officers and directors for mismanagement. Recent proposals seek to enhance the banking agency's ability to hold executives accountable for such mis mismanagement. Recent reform proposals seek to impose consequences through clawbacks of executive compensation on bank executives of failed banks. The relevance of this reform became clear when the Federal Reserve released its report last week on the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. The report finds that Silicon Valley Bank's incentive compensation arrangements encouraged excessive short-term risk-taking. Banker compensation should not encourage, let alone reward, excessive risk-taking that leads to significant loss or worse, a bank's failure. Clawbacks, especially mandatory clawbacks, are an appropriate consequence for such mismanagement. Moreover, clawbacks can help maintain or restore the public's confidence in our financial system. While I support the accountability of bank managers of failed banks, I urge that such proposals be considered in conjunction with reforms that would improve the accountability of managers of both failed and open institutions. Uh, strengthening existing administrative enforcement powers applicable to officers and directors of open institutions as well as closed uh, institutions offers two important advantages. First, explicit consequences for negligent behavior and failure of oversight could provide powerful incentives for bank executives to exercise prudence in managing fragile and often complex organizations and thus help prevent needless bank failures and the associated losses. Second, strengthening agency enforcement tools would better level the, com the competitive playing field between large and small banks. Given the reality of too big to fail, only managers of relatively smaller banks are impacted by the consequences triggered by a bank's failure. The recent failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and First Republic Bank highlight the importance of vigilance in maintaining the safety and soundness of our financial system. Bank executives form the frontline defense against bank failure. When bank executives fail in their responsibilities to protect the safety and soundness of their institutions, they should be held accountable to the public. Congress can enhance accountability through reforms aimed at both mismanagement at both failed and open banks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Schooner. We'll, we'll begin the questioning with Senator Tester of Montana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the hospitality, and I want to thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing, and I want to thank the folks who testified today. So, uh, thank you for all for being here. Uh, it is clear that the management of these banks made poor decisions. They ignored risk factors, ultimately resulted in failure. It's also clear that the regulators weren't dropping the hammer on these banks and the executives or the boards, even when the problems that supervisors had identified were not being addressed. Um, these were problems that the executives knew about, but instead of addressing them, they gave themselves bonuses which should make everybody in this room's blood boil. Regulators and law enforcement must take steps to investigate actions of the former bank management. Those folks responsible must be held accountable to make sure that similar mistakes aren't uh, made again, because if they're not addressed, they will be. Ms. Lynn, where are the gaps in our existing federal structure for holding these executives accountable? Are the laws there, or do we need to put more laws on the books? Thank you, Senator. For the Prohibition and Removal Authority, uh, as it is applied to 
thank executives and directors, senior bank leadership. There are important gaps that deter effective enforcement, effective use of this authority. The problems, in my opinion, are twofold. First is the culpability requirement, which requires regulators to show either personal dishonesty or a willful or continuing disregard for the safety or soundness of the institution. This demanding requirement broadly insulates directors and officers of large banks from liability or sanction because they can credibly deny knowledge of most operational details. The challenge of proving willful complicity increases as the distance to, to the wrongdoing, the wrong, uh, wrongful activity, uh, increases, especially when the misconduct relates to complex issues such as risk management. So is, do you have recommendations on what this committee could do to make, uh, uh, to address those gaps? Yes, Senator. Okay, would love to get them. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on because I only got five minutes. Ms. Schooner, uh, Professor Schooner, I should say, do, do you believe those gaps are there, and do you have recommendations if there, if you believe there are gaps that you could give this committee, give myself, the chairman, ranking member? Mike. Senator, I uh, I agree with Professor Lynn that uh, the standards for administrative enforcement yep. are unduly high, uh, requiring reckless uh, showing of reckless conduct, which especially with larger okay. institutions is problematic. Okay. Well, I would trust me if you get them to me. I, 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 I would love to see them. Mr. Kwame, are your views on sufficiency of federal regulators, law enforcement tools, um, what, what are your views on that to be able to hold executives accountable? You, you talked about in your opening statement that you thought they were there. Is, is, you stand by those. Yeah, we believe that uh, the authorities were there. We don't believe that the uh, regulators took a, you know, effective action. We are actually looking forward to the hearings that you're going to have here, right. both with those executives as with as with uh, Vice Chair Barr. And and if there's information that comes about where maybe our views are going to change a little bit on that, we'll be happy Perfect. to talk with you further. I, I want to clarify a little bit. Uh, I'm not talking about the regulations that the banks are held to, because I think all those regulations were there. The regulators had the ability to stop this from happening. They didn't drop the hammer. They did not. I'm talking about the the regulators have the ability to hold the bank executives accountable. So with you, with the specific point that you raised at the, at the start of your question about the bonuses that were paid, yeah. we need the information there because insider trading is, is illegal, right? 10B5 is not a safe harbor. I got you. So... We think that action should be taken. If it was inappropriate activity there, it should be, you know, it should be handled then. So the, the, I'm sure, uh, and I appreciate that perspective, by the way, Mr. Kwame. I, I am sure that you probably looked at this situation, particularly with Silicon Valley Bank, like we did. I mean, all the signs were there. I mean, all the signs. Why do you think we haven't heard anything about clawing back or holding people accountable? for Because I, I haven't heard a word about that. I believe, to some degree, we're still in the uh, investigatory stage with with the different uh, with the different agencies that are there, okay. um, and it takes a little bit of time. Okay, um, I have one more question, and that that deals with uh, um, um, that deals with regulation moving forward. You know what? I've run out of time. I'll put it for the record. You were kind enough to let me go first. I do not want to hold up the. Up. Thanks. I can. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll you yield, guys are I'll, both I'll, pretty. I'll, pretty yield, I'll yield you a minute of the chairman's time. Will you? Okay. <laughs> nice story. So one of my concerns about the outcome of this, because the Fed report pointed out that the regulation was there to handle it, that the regulators did not enforce the regulation and hold people accountable. One of my concerns is, is that there will be a push to get more regulation. I think that's going to happen. I don't think it'll happen, but I think there will be a push for it. But my concern is similar to what happened in 2008, that the regulators will respond in a way where they put the screws to the banks who are following the rules, and that the board is paying attention, that the executives are doing a good job. Do you see it the same way? And is there anything we can do to stop that? That's for Mr. Quabman. First off, Senator, you're a small businessman, yep. right? You understand how uh, many of those banks work. And that's why I said, you know, that there was an esoteric model with, with the banks we were talking about here. I do think with the Federal Reserve, um, I think there were several assertions made in the report without the data, which I think is troubling. 
there were certain assertions made about executive compensation about and that need to do more. Let me just read for you page 75 of the report for a second, one sentence from the report, which contradicts some of what the assertions are, which is why I think your inquiries are going to be even more important. Supervisors' interviews with the Compensation Committee Chair, SVP, indicated that the Compensation Committee decided not to reduce incentive compensation despite the known uh, weakness of the Enterprise Risk Management Program. Fearing this will lead to the increased attrition of senior increased attrition of senior executives due to executives' compensation already being lower than peer firms. So there's already contradictory information even in that report, which I think we need more information on. The, uh, uh, the only thing that I would just say is, is that this board of directors did not do their job. Their executives did not do their job. If they got paid minimum wage, they got overpaid. That's all. Uh, Senator Scott's recognized. John, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there's no doubt that the figure that we're looking at from the bank execs is un inexcusable, without any question. We, you and I will probably disagree on my next comment, but I will say that an administration that prints and spends trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, that would be embarrassing to any drunken person with somebody else's credit card, is remarkable. And having the Fed have 10 increases in about a year only exposes the vulnerabilities in a bank that is gambling on lower interest rates when every indication is they're going higher and higher and higher. And yet we don't have conversation about some of the underlying causes of an unstable, chaotic economy that leads to liquidity risks on a different topic. It is no secret that these banks were rife with mismanagement. I've said it myself time and again, and now even the regulators and the reports are confirming this truth. But the use of emergency powers may be just as detrimental to the continuity of our banking system going forward. If the government is always there to intervene and bail out a failing bank, this could promote riskier decisions in the financial sector moving forward. With potential bad actors hedging their bets with the strength of Uncle Sam, how could they lose? And that's not a bet I want to see. Principles of risk management are based around the possibilities of loss. And if we eliminate the reality of failure, there ends up being no cause for prudent management, only a masking of bad decisions waiting to implode, like they did with SVB. Mr. Quadman. Does the increased usage of emergency powers incentivize proper management? And you've already started that answer with John, with, with Senator Tester, without any question. But I th your last comment really struck me, and I wanted to, you to continue to expound upon this. This, this is a very important question. John and I both run businesses. Uh, and whenever you infuse in any sector the moral hazard that somehow you're just geniuses with no risk because there's no chance of failure, you do incentivize more and more bad behavior and less focus on the underlying issue of prudent management. No, Senator Scott, I, there's a lot to unpack there, but I think you are hitting on the right points of we've had an issue of moral hazard. We've had an extended period of time of zero interest rates where management and governance was not necessarily keeping uh, uh, pace with that. Additionally, regulators are not uh, keeping an eye on things as well. So when we had the cash go up, right, with the spending that was happening, and it had to go into bank deposits, um, there was not a, a sufficient focus on interest rate risk and, and the issues that had to happen there. The other one point I want to raise as well, and Senator Scott, we're, you know, as a small business person, regional banks are a very key player for Main Street businesses. They have been prudently um, acting um, and I have not had the same esoteric issues here. Yes. But again, if if the cop isn't if the cop on the beat isn't enforcing the law, new authority isn't going to do much. Amen. That's a good word. Uh, since 2008, the FDIC has filed dozens of lawsuits and entered into nearly 1,000 settlement agreements with officers, directors, and other professionals related to loss suffered by banks placed in FDIC receivership. Such actions have led to recoveries totaling more than four billion dollars. The FDIC has stated that it generally brings personal liability cases against the officers and directors of failed banks when there are 
these instances, dishonest conduct, inappropriate transactions with bank insiders, failure to establish, follow, or monitor sound underwriting policies and procedures, and failure to respond to concerns raised by regulators, accountants, counsel, or other professionals. Is there any reason to doubt that the FDIC has existing authority to hold senior leadership and, and directors personally liable? No, we think the authorities are there. Um, and clearly you cite the statistics that show that. Um, additionally, the, the Fed and other banking regulators have those authorities as well. But is, what is clear, even from the rudimentary information that we have with SVP and the other banks, is that sufficient action was not taken. And some of these issues in, in terms of, you know, one of where management is not communicating problems to the board of directors, that's a red flag that should have been jumped on immediately and wasn't. Yeah, two tools that work in your toolbox that you don't use doesn't mean you need a third one. Correct. Thank you. Reed. Uh, thanks, Senator Scott. Um, first question to all three of you, and please just answer yes or no. It's pretty straightforward. Do you agree that individual executives whose mismanagement and disregard for basic banking principles that led to the failure of these banks should face meaning, meaningful consequences for their action? Professor Lynn? Yes. Mr. Quadman? Yes, if the information shows that. Okay. Yes. Professor, thank you. It's clear, and this is for you, Professor Schooner, it's clear that in the case of SBB and Signature, bank executives failed to properly oversee and manage the risk of their institutions. Their compensation was tied to profits, which incentivized them to grow their banks, and SVB was almost unprecedented in the speed at which it grew. Uh, they also rewarded themselves with bonuses in the weeks and months leading up to their failure, even when regulators were raising red flag after red flag after red flag about risks at that bank. Do we need to deter this type of information um, by individual executives ahead of time so we can avoid a potential failure that put customers, the banking system, and ultimately taxpayers at risk? Yes, Senator. I think that we need to focus on the ongoing operations of banks in a safe and sound manner, and we shouldn't send the signal to uh, bank executives that when the bank fails, they can walk away, and that's it. Uh, I think that's the wrong kind of incentive. So we need to encourage uh, uh, prudent operations and management while banks are operating. Thank you. Professor Lynn, you've found that bank executives are rarely barred from the industry when they've engaged in mismanagement or poor supervision. Why ex is the existing removal power not suited for the executives of big banks like SVB and Signature? Thank you, Senator. Uh, there are two obstacles. Uh, the first is the culpability requirement, which currently is demanding. It requires personal dishonesty or a willful or continuing disregard for the safety and soundness of the institution. And especially in larger banks, the challenge of proving willful complexity is uh, increases as to the distance of the wrongdoing. Executives today are shielded from liability because of the diffuse decision-making structure that exists in most large and mid-sized institutions. Second, there is a mismatch between the responsibilities of bank executives and directors, which focus on systemic oversight, placing, uh, putting into place uh, systems, internal controls, structures that promptly detect and efficiently deter uh, operational risk, and the focus of the current authority to prohibit uh, bankers from the industry, which narrowly focuses on uh, discrete activities and whether or not there was knowledge of and participation in discrete uh, act, uh, wrongdoing. So I have two recommendations. The first is to adjust the culpability requirement, lowering it to perhaps uh, recklessness or negligence. Uh, and the second is to identify mismanagement and oversight failure as a discrete basis for removal and prohibition from the industry. Thank you. Um, last question, uh, Ms. Schooner. Unlike many other countries that only have a handful of mega banks, uh, the US banking system has thousands of small banks that serve local communities. How would strengthening our enforcement tools to hold bank executives accountable not only help prevent failures, but also improve fairness and competition between large and small banks? So, Senator, the reality is that most uh, administrative enforcement actions are brought against uh, the managers of failed institutions. And since megabanks don't fail, that means that they escape that kind of accountability. So I think uh, uh, reforming the administrative enforcement power that agencies currently have to better reach the managers of operating institutions would help level that playing field. 
I think all of us were concerned about um, the, you know, the GSEBs that seem to get larger and larger, even those that have not performed um, particularly well. Wells Fargo is always the one that jumps to mind that all of those banks got bigger with migration of deposits after the, the after SVB and SVB and Signature deposits were moving to those big banks, including Wells Fargo, to tens and tens of billions of dollars, and then. Then what happened just this week with um, FDIC choosing uh, under whatever decision making that was done, choosing J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, Senator Vance from Ohio is recognized. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank, thanks to Senator, uh, Senators Brown and, and Scott for hosting this important hearing. Um, you know, I, I'm working with some of my colleagues on some legislation related to clawbacks. And so I'm going to focus my line of questioning just on some very specific applications of how those how those potential statutes might work in practice. Um, in, in in particular, what we're worried about uh, is you know you take a situation like Silicon Valley Bank where executives paid themselves out very large amounts of money in the weeks and months leading up to the failure. And what's especially sick about this, of course, is the taxpayers end up bearing a lot of the risk of those failed decision making um, of that failed decision making, I should say. And the executives end up running away like bandits. And that strikes me as an especially unfair way to run a banking system where you can screw things up, pay yourself out fat bonuses, and then taxpayers end up dealing with the downside risk. Uh, so so I, I, two particular questions that have sort of come up in the conversations I've had with colleagues about this, sort of how to narrowly tailor this such that you're targeting the bank executives who caused these problems and not, let's say, an administrative assistant or a bank teller who had no decision-making authority and what ultimately led to the bank's collapse, whether that's Silicon Valley Bank or somebody else. So th this first question is going to, to, to Mr. Quadman. Um, and, and, and the question here is, can you, can you explain who gets caught up in the statutory definition of a, quote, institution-affiliated party? Um, you know, what, could that potentially capture a bank teller, an administrative assistant to an executive? Sort of how broad does that sweep? Because that influences how we draft this thing. It actually, um, it's extremely broad. You can also be talking about um, an, an accounting firm or a law firm that is providing services to uh, that banking institution as well. So, of course, you know, lawyers and accounts are also extremely important for management and governance purposes. Um, so, firms would be reluctant to engage with a business if that provision was there. And that, again, goes towards the talent issues and management issues. So uh, that is an issue of particular concern that we have. Great. Okay. That, that, that's, that's helpful to know um, and, and certainly a good knowledge for us to have. So, um, Ms. Sh Sorry. Professor Schooner, I uh, wanted to, to sort of direct this, this question to you. So, so one of the things that's that's sort of come up again on this this question of narrowing is um, is is the question of directors and whether they should be liable under some of these clawback provisions. And you know, I, I know from my time in the private sector that director usually means a member of the board of directors, but sometimes it could be a director of marketing or director of business development. So, so particularly that that word, if if you were to expose directors to clawback liability. Do you think that could be reasonably interpreted by a court or a regulator to cover mid-level managers who have the director title? Or do you think that would understandably by, by most be applied only to a member of the board of directors? Uh, Senator, I think it would only be applied to uh, the member of the board of directors. I've never seen that term uh, used in a statute used to apply to anybody other than the board. In other words, the, the term director is really taken from the incorporation of the of the entity and the uh, the responsible managers are the board of directors. So I would be very surprised if it was interpreted that way. Got it. Uh, I would love to get the that answer to that question from from Mr. Quadman and Mr. Lynn. Um, in in reviewing some of the uh, legislation announcements around it regarding the Warren Hawley bill, I think some of it could be. I, I agree in terms of the director issue. But I think some of the uh, definitions could in include uh, line employees as well, which I don't believe is the intent. I think it's more trying to be direct around senior executives and um, and others, where traditionally these compensation issues are more more aligned. We have other concerns with the legislation, but we do think it could be overbroad. What what, what is it that you think that could apply to, to line employees? I think it's how it, I think it's how it's defined. Okay. Um, 
Because there's, if you look at other compensation statutes, there are specific levels that are defined as to uh, where um, where entities, uh, as to who it, who it applies to. Got it. Okay, Mr. Lin. I, we, I agree with Professor Schooner, Senator, that directors are typically used to refer to the board of directors. And in fact, in several provisions, for example, in 1818E5, uh, the term directors and officers are specifically defined in a way that also enumerates activities such as substantial participation. And so uh, the focus of the statute um, and the aim of the statute has been always to deter, I use the term directors to mean boards of directors. Got it. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it. I yield. Thanks, Senator. And Senator Reed of Rhode Island is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, panel, for being here today. Uh, with Senator Grassley, I've introduced S1181. It's the Bank Management Accountability Act. And our legislation would authorize the FDIC to claw back two years of compensation from directors and senior executives of failed systematically important banks and ban them from the financial industry. And I, frankly, the, I think the American public is appalled that they're looking at CEOs of Silicon Valley Bank you know, getting $10 million, uh, walking out with even more in terms of stock, and nothing can be done. Uh, Professor Schooner, how would depositors, regulators in the bank industry, and the American people all benefit if Congress were to strengthen FDIC's outdated and weak authorities for ensuring accountability and uh, systematically in systematically important banks? So, Senator, I think you made an important point about the public's confidence in our financial system. I think that without clawback authority, uh, particularly in the circumstances we're just living through, I think really that confidence in the financial system might be reasonably shaken. I think that uh, reforms that would allow for that kind of accountability would not only impact the aftermath of a bank failure, but I also think it would impact the ongoing operations of a bank because bank directors and officers are quite aware of, highly aware of their responsibilities, and I think that they would adjust their behavior accordingly. And uh, Professor Lynn, do you have any comments? I fully agree with uh, Professor Schooner that when banks are held accountable to the public through uh, regulators, enhanced regulators authority, uh, those authorities seek to uh, incentivize bank directors to operate not in shareholders' interests, but also in the public's interest as well. We encourage them not to just focus on making the most profit on wealth maximization, but also taking steps to assure safety and soundness. And so by strengthening uh, enforcement authorities that regulators can use against bank officers uh, and directors, senior bank management, we strengthen their incentives to put the public's interests in mind. So I think both of you have... Uh, two conclusions. One, it would uh, enhance the confidence of the American public in the um, accountability and the uh, uh, dedication to their interests by bank executives. And second, it would be a, a constant reminder to, uh, to, to behave appropriately uh, by the directors. And in both cases, would enhance the overall uh, stability of the financial system. Is that fair? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Senator, I agree. I think it would have both of those effects. Thank you very much. Uh, the uh, other aspect is that I think probably has been touched upon, but you know, our whole society, the world society, is now uh, supercharged by virtual connectivity. Uh, and are there any quick sort of uh, thoughts you have about how the regulators deal with that? This is not Jimmy Stewart. Uh, standing in the lobby telling five people, don't worry, don't worry. It's instantaneously thousands of people being saying, get out, get out, get out of the bank now. Right. I, Senator, I do think that complexity both at uh, the bank operations level and uh, in regulation is a problem. Uh, in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, there was a lot of talk about uh, creating uh, regulatory rules that were simpler, that could be applied more uh, broadly, and I think we've sort of gone in the opposite direction. Regulation has become more and more complicated, and I think that makes it difficult for supervisors to apply those standards. 
Um, and so I think that uh, we could improve the system by improving, by uh, dealing with the complexity of the institutions as well as uh, regulation. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thanks, Senator Reed. Uh, Senator Brett of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all of you being here. Uh, Professor Lynn, I'll have to say, as someone who went back to law school with essentially a newborn and an 11-month-old, um, it particularly warms my heart to see Oliver here with you today. Thank you, Senator. I want to start by saying I am proud uh, from being from a state where financial institutions are really strong. While Alabamians every day continue to face the daily impacts of inflation and economic uncertainty that I believe have been caused by the Biden administration's failed policies, I am proud of the work our regional banks, community banks, and our credit unions have continued to play to instill confidence in Alabama and to support our communities. Regarding the recent failures of Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, and more recently First Republic, I continue to be concerned with regulators' blatant failure to utilize their current authorities ahead of these events. And I believe that recent reports from the Federal Reserve, FDIC, and GAO even further spotlight these failures. I look forward to having the regulators back to testify later this month and provide more definitive answers to this committee following their fact-finding exercises. On today's topic, I certainly agree with my colleagues that bad actors at any institution must be held accountable. In this particular case, it's clear that there were significant mismanagement and risk controls at both SVB and Signature um, that just went awry. And I believe any individual that knowingly contributed to or unjustly profited from the bank's failure and ultimate downfall should absolutely be held responsible. I want to discuss potential legislation, but before we do that, I think it's very important not to be duplicative. So very quickly, if we can just go across, and I will start with you, Professor Schooner. Um, you mentioned existing law. If we can very tightly talk about what law is on the books currently that could be used to, held, to hold these bad actors accountable. The bank regulators have uh, administrative enforcement authority to um, bring actions in a multiple different ways. Um, the, the the standards of culpability are high, though, and so that's where I think that there could be some reform uh, in those laws. Thank you, Mr. Quidman. Senator Britt, um, you know, if you take a look at the existing authorities that banking regulators have, that the Department of Justice has, we do uh, SEC has. We do believe that those authorities um, can hold those people accountable, um, and, and we think that, that um, it is important. That's why I raised the Credit Suisse art, uh, issue of if we put things out of balance, mm -hmm. it's actually going to make our banking system weaker, and mm -hmm. we don't want to go down that road. Okay, let's talk a little. Let's actually drill down on that. How do you feel like there could be something that would be narrowly tailored um, that would not do that? Because the problem is you want to make sure that you are holding bad actors accountable, but not um, being overly broad in clawbacks that deters talent from entering this industry. You all have said, obviously, the banking industry is so critical um, to making sure that this country continues to thrive in the way it does. And so we need the best and brightest going into the banking sector. So can you drill down on, on a narrowly tailored um, solution to that? One of the reasons why I think that the upcoming hearings are so important is that we have the bank saying to the regulators, SVB saying to the banking regulator, our comp packages are not, uh, you know, are not, are, are below where our peers are. Mm -hmm. But then there's all these governance issues that then the, the supervisors are flagging, but they're not doing anything on. So I think it's more looking at what, what broke down within the regulatory structure that needs to be done. Because it, that's why I said with Mr. Scott's uh, questioning, of if the cop on the beat is not enforcing the law, new laws aren't going to do anything. Correct, correct. Um, and Professor Lin. Thank you, Senator. I also agree that the the current uh, structure has enforcement tools at a regulatory uh, this, uh, at regulators' disposal, but their hands are tied. And what would you use if I made you right now try to hold these men and women un accountable who unjustly or enriched themselves? What would you use? There are three main tools. One is the Removal and Prohibition Authority, which bars the bankers from the industry. Okay. The second could be a civil money penalty order, which has been uh, used against executives. And third would be a personal cease and desist order, which could uh, 
ref, uh, halt certain activities and ask bankers to refrain from certain activities, identifiable activities in the future. Okay, and those are all on the books right now. That's what you would use. But right. their culpability standards make it difficult for our regulators to use, exec- especially against senior leadership at large banks. Okay, I am I'm out of time, but I certainly believe we need to hold these people accountable, um, but make sure that that's narrowly tailored to address the issue at hand. Thank you all. Thanks, Senator Britt. Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi. I just like to keep everything simple here. So uh, this is a question for really all three of you. So really, what do you think is the reason of the collapses? And why was it incompetency? Was it greed or was it virtuous risk? You guys. I think mismanagement was the primary cause. And incompetency? Just yes. Okay. okay. I think there was mismanagement. There were also supervisory failures that did not allow for appropriate governance to take place. Really? So, so you don't believe that they, there's, they, were, they were just incompetence? No, I, I think that there were issues in terms of with Silicon Valley Bank where they did not have a chief risk officer for a long period of time. They had a long transition with their chief financial officer, which created management issues. Um, but then where the supervisors were actually flagging some of these issues, they never took any follow-up action, which could have prevented the collapse from happening. So- Senator, I believe that it was mismanagement specifically that the leadership pursued a rapid unrestrained growth without appreciating or adequately controlling the increasing risks that the banks faced. Mismanagement. Was that really no clouded by greed or just, just incompetent? They're just, you know, they, were they just incompetent? You know, like I thought these were high achieving, you know, executives and, and successful uh, banks. And you know, were they? Do you think they could? It wasn't it had it wasn't greed, or, or did they not? Do you think? Did they think theoretically that they're like we can really crash really good because they're going to come cleaning up our mess here, kind of a thing? Because that, because that to me is, it, it, what do you what do you think? Like, because um, I don't think an average human being, uh, you know, in our nation, you know, wouldn't just say, hey, you know what, I'm going to run up. Too much debt. I'm going to be go come by bankruptcy. Being, I'm going to get get paid it off, kind of a thing. So, like, so do you do you do you think anything that's not part of it? This idea that that, that we, you know we're going to clean up my mess. Uh, Senator, I believe that mismanagement is the problem. But you're talking about the motives for mismanagement, and I think that uh, what the Fed report suggests. Yeah is that the motives were short-term uh, gains that were tied to compensation. In fact, I think it was one of the most uh, startling findings in the Federal Reserve's report. It's, Senator, first off, we look forward to the upcoming hearing that you're going to have with the CEOs of these banks to get more information to better understand that. But again, there was a failure of board oversight. There was a failure of management in making appropriate decisions. There was a failure of the supervisors to actually oversee this. Um, and interestingly enough, we had investors such as J.P. Morgan Chase issuing an investor note with Silicon Valley Bank in November, yet there was no action taken by the, the supervisors. So I think there's a lot of blame to, to, to go around here. Senator, I think that the incentives are twofold, at least, to the mismanagement. Uh, two, first, there is the problem of comp- uh, compensation, which drives incentives towards short-term gains. Second, as the reports reveal, there is the problem of growing banks, that the management, perhaps as a matter of, uh, which could be characterized as incompetence, did not grow with the size of the banks. Uh, so, and that led to incompetence uh, in the performance of their duties. Yeah, personally, just I mean, I just find it a hard time believing that, that they don't believe that that these banks realize that someone's going to come in and comes, you know, there to save me, and and I think they figure that it's just uh, the, the the kind of uh, risk is is they 
they're they're not they're they they know that because they're not going to be to to uh to to be held accountable and they're going to be made whole and and i just find that your average american would be find that outrageous so anyway uh, thank you thanks senator fetterman uh senator uh, Senator Warner is uh, recognized from his office. Senator Warner of Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you holding this hearing. Um, I agree with a lot of my colleagues' comments that uh, uh, I think this was a, a disaster that could have been avoided on SVB in particular. Um, the number of notices that the regulators had and the bank management had that things were going awry and the fact that nobody acted on those um is is extraordinarily problematic also appreciate the fact that you've got professor Dahlin uh from university of richmond another great uh, uh law school another great virginia pro uh, uh, person on on this panel and i've i've listened in on some of her comments um as you know mr chairman i've i've uh, along with a lot of other members co-sponsored all of the legislation out there on um the ability to to claw back uh, provisions from management who um, uh, are irresponsible, who make these kind of uh, mistakes. Um, I do know, and I appreciate the fact that that uh, you know we need to to move on some of this legislation. And look forward to a, a markup taking place uh, soon. And again, when we we're seeing what may be follow on of SVB and first signature, you know the dislocation that's taking place in the regional bank markets today. Uh, you know, we are seeing uh, what appears to be to a meltdown and a lot of this not due to maybe necessarily bad management practices uh, but um, the potential for contagion that's taking taking place but making sure we've got rules in place for clawbacks making sure that our, the regulators move forward on the um, uh, on the executive compensation issues um, is something that uh, I, I know other colleagues have mentioned as well I guess my one question for the whole panel will be about the role of boards of directors. I, I just in, in answering Senator Fetterman's questions about board responsibilities. Um, I think too often bank boards have been viewed as a, a nice perk to have, um, but with that ought to be greater level of responsibility. I know, Professor Stoner, that you've, you've talked about this, but could the whole panel give us some guidance on uh, what policy recommendations we should put in place to make sure that um, uh, bank board, all board responsibilities, but bank board responsibilities in particular are taken in a more serious vein, uh, both incentive wise and potentially penalty wise, if, if bank boards, as in the case of SVB, um, don't take the, the, do their, take their actions responsible. So I'd ask the whole panel to watch that. Thank you for that question, Senator. And as a Virginia native, I'm happy to take this particular question from you. Uh, so uh, the, the boards of directors, the functioning of the board of directors is different from the uh, executive suite in that boards are responsible for overseeing operations and making sure that risk, man risk management procedures are in place. Um, that can lead to unsafe and unsound banking practices, but our current administrative uh, enforcement laws could be amended to make clearer that that oversight function is the standard by which directors are held. Uh, Senator. Wouldn't, even on that level, wouldn't a, the absence in the case of SVB of not having a chief, chief risk officer for eight months uh, when the bank was experiencing this kind of growth, wouldn't that have been a board responsibility to hold management accountable? Absolutely. Senator, I, I was just going to say, as with any public company, board, the board is an ex extremely important part of the oversight function and governance of, of the company. As you just cited, the lack of a chief risk officer was a board issue. The lengthy transition of the CFO was a board issue. What is also concerning coming out of the uh, Federal Reserve Report, which I think we need more information on, is also how management was not reporting to uh, the board information that they should have had where the board should have taken action on as well. So we're looking forward for more of the information coming out of your hearings to better understand where those failures were and, it, and what action, if any, should be taken. Thank you. Senator, the 
the enforcement actions that are currently at the regulator's disposal do not take into account oversight responsibilities clearly uh, as a basis for 40 actions. So, for example, in Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo had implemented, according to a report, better tools and systems to detect employees who did not meet their sales goals than it did to catch employees who engaged in sales practices misconduct. This is a problem of board oversight. They did not implement the proper structures, systems, and internal controls. Yet, for a prohibition action, the regulators are asked to train their eyes solely on the wrongful activity, the sales, who knew and who engaged in the sales misconduct themselves, rather than what structures were in place, what board failures there were. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Senator uh, Warner. Uh, Senator Tillis of North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I was just, uh, I've been watching the hearing when I've had opportunity to in my office, and Senator Fetterman asked a question of all three of you. Uh, and he had to do with what the root cause was of the bank failure. Uh, Ms. Daylin, did I pronounce that right? Yes, Senator. You said it was management. I agree. Uh, Mr. Quadman, you said it was management and supervision. I agree. Uh, Ms. Schooner, you said management. Uh, why did the two of you not mention any uh, uh, skepticism around the level of supervision and that being a potential root cause. And uh, the chief risk officer is, is an obvious one, I agree. That was a miss of management. I think uh, the CEO not understanding its liquidity threats and its in, internal liquidity stress testing results that he had to have some indication of before he dumped stock. And this is also something who was a class A director on the board of directors who lost his job um, the day that the failure was identified. Why wouldn't the fact that three matters uh, requiring attention and three matters requiring immediate attention, what we don't know yet and we hope to uh, find out in the report is whether or not any of those MRAs become MRIs. Why didn't management act on that and why didn't the supervisory function press the accelerator on getting a response and resolution to that? Um, it, it just seems to me on its face that I could get into more details, but it just seems to me on its face, anybody that's looking at this to not stipulate that it was both a breakdown in executive management and every single dime that we can claw back from anybody in the C-suite, we should, and I do believe that there are devices to, uh, to do that now that we should act on. But why wouldn't that be a part of your observation of some of the factors that likely led to, the real, uh, led to it? Not to mention the overall portfolio, if, if you take a look at Silicon Valley Bank, we, we have other banks that are now getting caught up uh, by its depositors thinking, well, maybe they were like Silicon Valley Bank. There are only a handful of banks that have the kind of risk portfolio that SVB had. So, uh, Ms. Daylin, why wouldn't you have mentioned supervision as a part of the root causes behind the, uh, or a, a, a supervision lapse? as one of the potential root causes. I have the same question for you, Ms. Schooner. Thank you, Senator. I do think that we found out two uh, important causes of the, uh, of the, uh, the recent bank failures from the reports that were released last week. Uh, first, senior leadership was pursued or incentivized to pursue short-term uh, growth. Yeah. I'm talking more about the, the supervisory question. But yes, also we learned that regulators missed obvious problems and they were slow to address the problems they did recognize and manage. Oh, okay. and they were, so I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I don't want to be the last per Oh, well, S Senator Warren's here, so I won't be the last person. Um, so, so it was not that you don't think that uh, there's clearly some questions to be answered there in response to Senator Fetterman's question. You just didn't go down that path in, in your response. You said it was a failure of management. But, but you also understand there are questions that have to be asked on the supervisory function? Yes, Senator. I, the reports... Uh, uh, that, that's, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I hate the five-minute limit, but it's there for a reason. Ms. Schooner? I answered Senator Fetterman's question because I interpreted it as asking me what the primary cause of the okay. failure was, and I see it as a management failure. I agree with you that regulatory forbearance is a persistent problem in our system, yeah. um, but I also think that it's very important to keep in mind uh, a finding about Silicon Valley Bank, which was, I found alarming, that the um, 
management was relying on bank regulators yeah. to help them manage their interest rate risk, and that is backwards. I agree. I think there's one more layer to the supervisory discussion where I know I disagree with some of my colleagues who didn't support Senate Bill 2155, uh, but we did not stipulate that regulatory, there, there, there are escalation options because we said that they may be able to take a given bank based on its activities and the risks that a supervisor perceives and uh, subject them to uh, a regulatory regimen that we don't think is necessary for other banks with very different uh, portfolios. Uh, so I also want to know why the supervisor chose not to do that, particularly if that supervisor had six outstanding MRAs or MRIAs. Uh, that to me uh, leads me to believe that we may find out uh, if we have an objective assessment, if there was equal weight in that. CEOs were incompetent. You need to claw back as much of their compensation as possible. Maybe the supervisory function of the Fed uh, in uh, San Francisco uh, could have equal weight and why that failed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Jones. Senator uh, Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in its postmortem of the Silicon Valley bank collapse, the Fed found that legislation passed out of this committee in 2018 led to weakened rules for big banks that were major contributors to SVB's failure. The lessons, I think, are clear. Regulators need to strengthen bank oversight, and Congress must reinstate stronger rules. And here's a place to start. SVB, Signature Bank, and First Republic all lobbied Congress to weaken the guardrails, preventing them from making risky bets with depositors' money. And then, surprise, surprise, these executives took risks to boost their short-term profits, gave themselves huge salaries and bonuses and stock options, and when they crashed their banks, they walked away with fortunes. That's why Senators Cortez Masto, Senator Hawley, Senator Braun, and I introduced a bipartisan bill to ensure that when executives crash their banks and threaten the banking system, those executives are forced to give up their fancy compensation packages. Professor Lin, you are an expert on corporate governance and financial regulation. If our failed bank executives clawback act, which applies to failed banks, no matter how they are dealt with by the FDIC, had been the law of the land when SVB failed, would it have applied to SVB executives? Yes, I believe so, Senator. Uh-huh. And would it have applied to signature executives? I believe so, Senator. And would it have applied to First Republic executives? I believe so. All right. SVB, Signature, and First Republic were resolved by the FDIC through different processes using different statutory authorities. To make clawbacks effective, we have to give regulators broad authority to claw back executive pay whenever banks collapse, regardless of the specific process that the FDIC uses to pick up the pieces. Now, Unsurprisingly, bank executives hate clawbacks. They want to keep on taking risks with zero consequences. Professor Lin, if our banking regulators had had the choice whether or not to claw back executive compensation after a bank failure, would you expect Wall Street to exert significant pressure on them not to use that authority? Yes, I think that's a real possibility. You know, it is clear that giving regulators power to do something is not always enough. Congress needs to force regulators to use it, which is what Senators Cortez Masto, Hawley, and Bronze and my bill does. Now, in its review of the SVB collapse, the Government Accountability Office found that, quote, in the five years prior to 2023, Regulators identified concerns with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, but both banks were slow to mitigate the problems the regulators identified and risk built up over time. Professor Schooner, if regulators had had the authority they needed to claw back compensation from SVB executives, would it be reasonable, in your view, for them to consider the executive's actions and pay since 2018 
when the regulators first began warning a SVB about its risky practices. Senator, I think that would be very reasonable. Um, uh, incentive arrangements often rely on short-term metrics that uh, it takes the long term to determine whether those involve excessive risk. So I think giving regulators the opportunity to capture that kind of excessive risk taking is reasonable. Okay, that's very helpful, thank you. You know, Congress needs to put in place tough rules that make sure that executives pay up when their actions lead directly to a bank failure. And in order for us to do that, the regulation needs to do three things. Force regulators to claw back compensation from the executives who are responsible for the failure. Second, apply in all cases of bank failure, no matter how the particular form comes out. And third, allow up to five years of compensation to be clawed back. My bill with Senators Cortez Masto, Hawley, and Braun achieves all three of those, and I hope that this committee will take action on it soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto, I understand, is um, joining us from her office from Nevada. She's not. Uh, we'll wrap up if they. Oh, they say they're on the way. Well, I'll just make a closing statement because they're not here. Um, bottom line is bank executives are responsible for these failures. They need to be accountable. I agree with Ranking Member Scott that if this bank were a restaurant with 31 safety violations, it should be shut down, but it, it would not be shut down if the chief health inspector is telling the inspectors to go easy on the restaurant because keeping people safe is just as important. That's what former Vice Chair Quarles said um, after he weakened the rules at the Fed, what he said, that's why we need to strengthen regulatory guardrails. Uh, thanks for our witnesses today for their testimony. Senators who wish to submit questions, for the record, these questions are due one week from today, Thursday, May 11th. To the witnesses, please submit your responses to the questions, for the record, 45 days from the day you receive them. Uh, the meeting is adjourned.